many different ways that people talk about zone two. In fact, just prior to hopping on this uh, Instagram thing, um, I was on a call with uh, some other doctors and, and this question came up, which is, well, my patients keep asking me, what is zone two? And do you define it by heart rate? And what does this mean? And, I, and, and it's important to understand that the zone two that I'm referring to is a, is a, is a very pure definition. It's a physiologic definition. Frankly, it's a cellular definition. Um, so there are uh, ways that people just say, look, zone two is 80% of your maximum heart rate, or zone two is a certain percent of your maximum power output, or what's, what we might even call your functional threshold power. Um, I'm referring to something totally different, and it is a cellular definition, which is the highest level of energy you can put out while keeping lactate below two millivolt. Okay, that's a lot. Let's explain what it means. So uh, anytime you're undergoing cellular respiration, um, your body is basically converting glucose or fatty acids into ATP. And that process can be done very efficiently with oxygen. But as the demand for ATP, which is energy, gets higher and higher and higher, your body has to start making trade-offs and it has to start going quicker uh, than it would like to and not just utilize the mitochondria and doing this process outside of the mitochondria. And in doing so, one of the byproducts of that is lactate. So we use lactate as a proxy for any time your body is exceeding the capacity of the mitochondria. And once you exceed about two millimole of lactate, which is not a very high amount, um, certainly higher than you are at rest, but nowhere near what you would be exerting when you do an all out effort, you have sort of exceeded the threshold of the mitochondria to stay in an equilibrium where it can clear the amount of lactate it produces. So that's how I define uh, zone two. And when I say I do, I don't mean that this is my definition. I'm saying that's the definition that I use personally and with my patients. Okay. Um, a question that is not actually posed there, but I think it's worth just before we get into the how often should I do it is why does this matter? Um, it's my belief that this is the most important place to be training your mitochondria. And if we understand that mitochondrial function and the deterioration of mitochondrial function is one of the hallmarks of aging, then anything we can do to uh, delay that process and enhance mitochondrial function is going to be a benefit. Okay, so how often should I do it? Well, we don't really know the answer, um, and it probably depends in part on how fit you are coming in. So if you take somebody who is relatively deconditioned, um, they might only be able to accommodate 30 minutes three times a week. Um, and by the way, their exertion level is going to be amazingly low. So I prefer to do all of my zone two on a bike. And the reason for that is, you know, on a bike, you have watts. Watts are the ultimate um, metric of output, which is not to say you can't be just as um, you know precise when you're using a treadmill. Um, but on, a, on an indoor bike trainer, uh, you know, putting my bicycle on this thing called a Wahoo Kicker, I get you know just perfectly precise information. And I like to really think about everything in watts per kilo. So how many watts am I generating divided by my uh, mass in kilos. And when you look at really, really unhealthy people, people who are metabolically very sick, they would have a zone two threshold, meaning they exceed that two millimole uh, probably by the time they're at one watt per kilo of activity. Conversely, when you look at the absolute fittest of the fit, so if you look at professional cyclists who would be about as fit as any athlete could possibly be, uh, they're actually going to be closer to about four watts per kilo in terms of how much work their bodies can do while still keeping lactate below two millimole. So personally, I do about three to four hours a week of zone two. And for my patients, I believe that three hours should be the target. Understanding, of course, that you know most people have a job and they can't do this full time. 
But the reality of it is if you look at a professional athlete during the early season in their training, they could easily be spending 20 to 24 hours a week in zone two. Next question is how long should I do it for? And again, this is a great question. You know, I've asked this question and many others that are being posed today specifically to Inigo San Milan. And if you haven't listened to that podcast, I would definitely recommend it. We get very deep into the weeds on this stuff. Um, Inigo believes that, you know, 45 minutes is probably about the minimum per session. So in other words, if, if you were gonna commit to three hours a week, in 45 minute blocks, you probably wouldn't want to go any shorter uh, versus, you know, say doing 20 minute blocks every single day or something to that effect. Um, in my experience is it does take a while to get into that sort of steady state. Um, you know, short intervals of zone two don't seem to produce the same effect as long intervals. So again, it depends on your fitness, but um, certainly uh, I would say, um, you know, striving to have as much uh, time as you can is, is reasonable. And I generally recommend people start at 30 minutes if they're new to the activity, uh, 45 if they're not. Can I do other exercises before or after? Well, that's really a great question and it depends a little bit on your goals. So could you do strength training before and then zone two after? Well, from a zone two perspective, you could, but I think actually the research would suggest that if one of your goals is hypertrophy uh, or even strength, uh, you know, big gains in strength, it's probably counterproductive to finish an intense strength training workout and jump immediately into zone two. Um, the converse or the reverse of that is probably less of an issue. Personally, I separate them on all but one day. So there's only one day when I do zone two and strength on the same day, and I separate them by several hours. Uh, so there's one day a week, it's, it's Sunday for me, when I'll do a zone two in the morning and a strength in the afternoon. But if you're saying, look, Peter, I've only got three days when I can make it to the gym, in what order should I do them? I would recommend doing the zone two first and following it by the strength so that you don't eat into your strength goals. Does it matter if I slip into zone three, four, five during a 45 minute zone two workout? Great question. And frankly, this is why I do my zone two indoors. You could say, God, it must be boring as all hell to ride your bike indoors. And you know what? You're absolutely right. It's kind of boring to be sitting there indoors on a trainer three or four hours a week, uh, you know, listening to audiobooks and podcasts. The advantage is I have complete and total control over the wattage. And if I were outside riding my bike, that would not be the case. In fact, there is no way I could hold the wattage at an exact number riding outside, even if I were on a completely flat surface. It just doesn't work that way. So the short answer is the more time you dip out of zone two, the more counterproductive it is. Because by definition, when you're in zone three, four, five, you're producing far more lactate than your body can clear. And therefore, um, you're taking the mitochondria out of that sweet spot. So the goal should be to uh, do this basically in some mechanism where you have great control over this. Now, look, back when I was riding a bike pretty seriously, um, and I was good enough to be at perfect equilibrium, and we had a spot where we trained for time trials, um, I was able to one day a week do a three hour ride in circles basically where I was constantly at zone two. But you know, I just think for many people, um, we wanna separate sort of the outdoor harder stuff or even the more recreational stuff from this. And I, and I really think of this zone two as kind of a pill. Um, and and uh, you know, I think that a bike and, a, and, and frankly a treadmill are probably the easiest ways to get it. Um, sometimes I do it on a stair machine, like one of those endless stair climber things where again, I have pretty good control. Okay, what are the benefits? Well, we sort of already talked about this, but I, I think the most important benefits are, are physiologic. So um, the more zone two you do, the better you are able to do both glucose, uh, pardon me, insulin sensitive and insulin uh, independent glucose uptake. So this makes for very efficient mitochondria when it comes to glucose disposal. And, and that's really one of the hallmarks of metabolic health. So again, when you go back to what I said earlier about these people that are 
you know, have a zone two threshold that's as low as one watt per kilogram, and you contrast that with people who are at the other end of that spectrum at four watts per kilo, right? Like the fittest of the fit and the least fit. When you look at the glycemic difference, basically people with type two diabetes are gonna be down at this one milligram, per, uh, one watt per kilo, and the people up at four uh, watts per kilo are basically gonna be the most carbohydrate sensitive people imaginable. And remember, every day you age, you're becoming less and less insulin sensitive, less and less carbohydrate sensitive, or more and more carbohydrate sensitive, less and less carbohydrate uh, resistant. And so we want to push the boundaries of that as much as possible. Um, I think the other benefits, there's certainly some evidence that this uh, increases our mitochondria's ability to combat reactive oxygen species um, and all sorts of other uh, damaging processes involved in inflammation. Is it beneficial at any age, young or old? I would say emphatically the answer to that question is yes. And of course, a younger person um, is going to have more bandwidth, physiologic bandwidth, I mean, to explore a broader array of energy zones. So, um, you know, a younger person is going to be able to make zone to uh, probably a smaller part of their overall exercise program. And whereas I think as we get older, uh, even certainly at my age, you know, it's, I'm less interested in now how well I'm performing for any reason other than my overall health. And therefore I put more of my relative exercise time into zone two. Um, it also, again, it's always worth reiterating this point. Um, you know, the amount of time you spend in zone two is heavily dependent on what your aspirations are. Um, and what energy zones you spend any time in are going to come down to that. So for example, I really only spend time in two energy systems when I'm exercising. So right now I'm in zone one, which is to say doing nothing, um, but I basically only exercise in zone two and zone five. Occasionally I go into six, but I spend virtually zero time in zone three and four, pretty much never. Um, and the reason is I don't do a sport I don't you know, race or do something that requires that physiologic level, so I'm not really optimizing for it. I'm optimizing for metabolic health at two extreme ends of the spectrum. Why should I do it compared to any other options, for example, HIT or high intensity interval training? Well, it's doing something quite different from HIT. Uh, in fact, this is funny. This came up exactly on a call that I had, as I was saying. What I was saying is I think a lot of the HIT literature benefits from the fact that HIT is so easy to study because it's a, it's a relatively easy medicine to take if you think of exercise as an intervention because you know you can say, well, look, you're gonna do a four minute Tabata twice a week and we know that everybody can do that and if the control arm is doing nothing, then you have a pretty good sense of what you're doing. Um, but we don't wanna confuse the, the promising or interesting literature on HIT with um, the benefits that we see from a more protracted uh, type of activity like this. I would say that they're doing different things, um, which is not surprising, right? If, if anyone's ever done you know, a Tabata versus a steady zone two, you realize they're, they're as dissimilar as fasting is from eating a Mediterranean diet. Why would we expect those things to be the exact same? So I would say, don't, the, the, the question, why should I do this instead of hit is a false equivalency. Right? I would say instead think, why can't I do both? Or whether you choose to do HIT or Zone 5, which are different, um, think of it through that lens. Can I use a lactate meter sparingly? Absolutely. In fact, I was just going to talk about that. So this is what I use to check my lactate. Now, if you follow me at all, you know I'm a numbers guy. I'm all, you know, I've got two glucose meters on. I'm always doing something crazy. Um, and I check my lactate after every single zone two ride. And since I'm doing four of them a week and I've been doing them for almost three years and I write down every single day, I write down, this was my power. This was my heart rate. This was my lactate. You can imagine how many of these cards I've got stored up. Do you need to do that? Of course not. Um, for one thing, it's a stupidly expensive pastime. I don't remember how much this thing cost, but it wasn't cheap, it was probably 200, 250 bucks. But what really gets you is these damn strips, which 
it's their four bucks a pop because it's like a hundred bucks for 25 of these. So, you know, I'm wasting 16 bucks a week just checking my lactate. But why do I do it? Well, I do it because I've learned so much about how understanding where my zone two is on any given day is a function of my power. In other words, how much power am I putting out on the bike? My heart rate, how I feel, how rested I am, um, where I am physiologically in my stress cycle. So am I overtrained or undertrained? Uh, frankly, even my glucose level tends to play a role. And so uh, just, just to give you two examples, um, the last two workouts I did, so today's and Sunday's, had the exact same power to the watt, the exact same heart rate to the watt. On Sunday, my lactate was 2.1 at the end. What does that mean? That means I was actually a little bit outside of my zone too. And the funny thing is, in retrospect, I kind of felt a little bit tired. Today, I thought, I'm going to see how I feel, but I was ready to bring it down a notch. And by the end of the workout, I was like, no, I feel fine. And I was at 1.4 millimole today. And that told me, hey, rely a little bit more on how you feel. You could have pushed the wattage a bit higher today. So, um, if you, let, so, so let's put it aside for a moment. If you want to use lactate monitoring, you're going to get the best insight possible. What if you don't? Uh, either because you don't feel like wasting the money or you don't like poking your fingers or whatever. Then what I think you do is you start to triangulate between heart rate and perceived exertion. I always think a great place to start is where Phil Maffetone has people start for the MAF, which is 80% of maximum heart rate. But I want to make sure that people understand when we say maximum heart rate, we mean actual maximum heart rate, not predicted. So if you want to know your maximum heart rate, actually do some crunching and munching. Like you, you got to actually um, go out there and figure out what your maximum heart rate is. And when you know that number, um, you know, doing a treadmill test or some sort of exertion test, uh, then what you do is um, you take 80% of that and say, I'm going to start there. As far as exertion goes, uh, I would say, you know, I can mostly nasal breathe in zone two, but frankly, it's a bit uncomfortable. But I certainly am not going, you know, the way I am when I'm doing something all out. So I can mostly nasal breathe and I can talk, but I just don't want to. Um, someone asked me if I was going to do this one hour session whilst doing zone two. And I actually thought about it, but I was like, eh, it's just, uh, it's not going to be that much fun for me. Not that this is that much fun, but anyway, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it would just be t too much of, um, too much of a, a stress. Whereas you could at least entertain that idea. Um, so what I would say in the best state is maybe periodically check your lactate like once a month once a week um, and learn to rely on those other signs and, 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 and things such as your heart rate and your uh, perceived exertion. Um, duh, 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 duh. Okay, so I think let's just start taking some of the live questions now. I do have more questions here, but let's, um, let's, oh boy, there's some really other good ones. Okay, anyway, let's just, let's just see what people are asking. Okay. Um, how it how is it eighty percent? My Garmin at zone two is sixty to seventy percent. This is confusing. Okay, so good question. So heart rate monitors when they tell you their zones, they might not be. They're probably not referring to the zones we're talking about. Your Garmin might be working off the seven zones that are cycling power zones, the FTP zones, and you're absolutely right. An FTP zone two is well below a lactate zone two. In fact, um, and I'm very familiar with those seven zones because that's what we trained in cycling. And I know that my cycling zone two, uh, sorry, my current zone two uh, would have placed me sort of low zone three on the cycling one. So again, what I would say is always discard the definitions of what everybody else is telling you, zone two, zone three, it's irrelevant. It, call this a new, you know, a new thing and, and let's just deal with that. All right. I need to lose 145 pounds. 
what do I need to do to kick my ass into gear? I don't really know, but I think zone two would definitely play a role in that. Do you recommend, uh, I can't read, boy, these are moving too quick. How do you find zone two or watts on a treadmill? Great question. Okay, um, it's really the same way. So let's just talk about how you first make a stab at your zone two um, if you're trying to titrate that level up. So on a treadmill, what I recommend is not doing the flat setting and going as fast as you can go, but instead using an incline and a brisk walk. So um, what I recommend is it depends on, you know, your knees and your fitness and things like that, but it would be, you know, sort of start at 6% and three miles per hour. Um, now, I wouldn't even test a level or make an assessment until I'm at least 15 minutes of steady state. Um, and then I would do, if, again, I think at the outset you just have to accept using lactate on some level. Um, and then I would do the check and then adjust accordingly. But I, I would give myself a minimum of 15 minutes between making any changes. Um, I do want to make one other point that, I, that I, is worth making for anybody who's going to be using one of these devices, which is unlike glucose, which when you check glucose using, you know, a device like this with a glucose strip, it's more than sufficient to just take an alcohol pad, wash off your hand and poke it. But lactate uh, is not really something that comes off with alcohol. It needs soap and water. So um, when you're testing lactate, you have to be able to wash your hands with soap and water. And when I was early on um, doing this testing, I would actually keep a super, I would keep two rags in buckets next to my bike on the stand and one was like a super soapy one and then one was just a clean one. And so when I was on the bike having to test, I would ride, do the, clean my hands, it was soapy and do the whole thing. And so whether you're on a bike or you're on a treadmill, you're at the outset going to probably have to do that if you're doing a graded test to find your level. Um, the other thing to note if you're not doing it on a device that for which uh, watts is spit out is pay attention to the METs or metabolic equivalents. So on a treadmill or on a Stairmaster or something like that, you'll often see METs spit out as the equivalent. Um, and of course there's a conversion between them, but it doesn't really matter for the sake of this. Does your zone two range significantly change over time as you gain in fitness? Phenomenal question. and. Exactly. Not only does it change over time, it should be an aspiration of your fitness. So when I started doing zone two again uh, a few years ago, um, I was really out of zone two shape, to be completely uh, honest. All I had been doing was high level intensity training. So I was lifting weights like crazy. I was doing tons of sprinting, tons of Tabata, tons of that, and my aerobic base had withered away to nothing. And when I did my first zone two test, it was about 175 watts, uh, maybe 170 watts on a bike. And I was shocked. I was like, that's really amazing that it could be that low given what I know it used to be. Um, and, you know, today it's about 215 to 220 watts. Um, so that's better. And I think my aspiration is I want to be at about 240 watts by next year. Um, and again, that's all based on my metrics of watts per kilo because I, I want to be at three watts per kilo, which I think is, you know, good for an old guy who's not professional athlete. Um, so yes, we absolutely want to track this metric and I believe everybody should know their zone two in watts per kilo and should be just as concerned with that as they are with any other metric such as VO2 max or how much they can deadlift or whatever it is. Um, I just saw a question about MAF using 180 minus your age and I think that is a very reasonable place to start but it is not the same. Um, and so, for example, if you go 180 minus my age, um, that puts me about eight beats per minute lower than my zone two heart rate. Another thing I want to point out is my zone two heart rate has also gone up over time with my zone two power. So as I've gotten more efficient, I can not only do more work at zone two, 
but I can actually sustain a higher heart rate at zone two. Although, as far as I can tell, my maximum heart rate has not changed one iota in five years. It's uh, on Sunday, I did a, a max heart rate effort and it was to the beat what it was about five years ago. So I don't think it's been any, I don't think there's been any demonstrable change on my ceiling. I just think my zone two is, 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 is ratcheting up a little bit. Uh, can you rent one of those lactate devices? Man, I, I don't know if you can, but you sure should be able to. Um, and I don't know if that's an interesting enough business, but I, I would certainly lend mine to a friend if they needed it and didn't want to fork over. Zone two before or after meeting, uh, but sorry, before or after eating, and then the sensitivity of lactate threshold power. Okay, uh, great question on the eating. Um, I have noticed that it depends on what you eat, of course, but if you eat something that spikes your glucose, um, I notice that that can have um, some impact on lactate, um, but not as much as I would have guessed. So keep in mind, glucose is obviously an important substrate for the mitochondria, um, and as is fatty acid. Um, in a fasted state, your body has more access to fatty acid uh, than in a fed state, okay? So, so let's just restate that. So when you're fasting, you're at your lowest level of insulin, which means you have the maximum amount of fatty acid turnover, so you, your body is going to have most access to your fat stores. And um, of course, depending on your insulin sensitivity, you may have a lot or a little free fatty acid floating around. Um, and you'll obviously have some amount of glucose just because of the liver doing its thing and keeping uh, glucose in the circulation. Now, what you eat can also factor into that. So if you eat a high fat meal, you're also gonna have a ton of fatty acid substrate laying around. If you eat a high carb meal, you're definitely gonna eliminate fat because you're going to just have the glucose from the meal, the glucose from your circulation, and you're gonna suppress the glucose of your, uh, pardon me, suppress the, um, uh, the liberation of fatty acid. So I don't think I can speak to this convincingly, but I would say empirically or anecdotally, I think a high carb meal slightly uh, impairs my zone two, meaning I will tap out earlier because I'm forcing all the substrate to be glucose. Um, the other question that was asked there was, if I understood it correctly, how does zone two uh, compare to threshold power? Um, so if that's the question, what that person's referring to is I, presumably functional threshold power. So uh, for anyone who's a cyclist, they know what that means. So functional threshold power is the maximum power you can sustain for one hour. And for most cyclists, Knowing that number is super important. So whether you're a climber or a time trialist or a road racer or a crit rider, you should know that number. And most of your training is predicated on knowing that. And in cycling, um, the, the Andrew Coggin uh, system is based on seven zones around that number. So every zone is a percent of FTP and FTP sits in about zone four, upper zone four. So by that metric, our, the zone two I'm talking about is lower zone three. So if you're coming at this and you're a cyclist and you're saying, what's this zone two that Peter's talking about? Plug yourself into the bottom of your zone three and that's about where you'll be. Can zone two improve insulin independent uptake after a meal? Yes, it most certainly does. Um, in fact, I notice that after a zone two, my carbohydrate tolerance is really at its highest. Um, and I can you know, put away a couple hundred grams of, um, of glucose with barely a budge on my CGM, especially if it was done fasted. Because remember, if you're doing it fasted, you've got the added benefit of depleted glycogen to begin with, and then you add this insulin sensitivity stimulus, and so you've got, and the utilization of muscle glycogen, uh, so you, you really ramp that up. Uh, zone two for patients taking metformin. Oh, good, I'm, I'm glad somebody brought this up. Okay, so um, in my experience, both personally and with other patients, 
uh, metformin categorically lowers zone two. Um, so what we notice in patients on metformin is even fasting, uh, pardon me, even at rest, so before you do the test, uh, your, their zone, their, their, I'm sorry, their, their, their plasma lactate or um, you know, capillary lactate uh, can easily be close to two. Um, and why is that? Well, um, you know, metformin inhibits complex one of the mitochondria, among other things, metformin, metformin does so many things, uh, that I suspect part of what it's, in, it, what it, what it's doing is sort of weakly poisoning the mitochondria. And so um, when a patient's taking metformin, uh, we tend to notice they have higher uh, fasting or resting, I'm sorry, resting levels of lactate and their zone two thresholds are lower than when we stop the metformin. Uh, and I've done experiments on and off metformin and I notice a 15 to 20 watt difference. Uh, so in other words, on metformin, my zone two is 20 watts lower. Now, that's interesting, but I, it, I still don't know the answer to a question, which is, does that matter, right? So in the end, we wanna be very careful that we're not just in the number chasing game. You know, What's really interesting to me is, is there a true physiologic, um, consequence to metformin that matters beyond what the number is. And to answer this question, actually, uh, myself and another person are going to be funding a study that looks at this in healthy volunteers. So uh, this is a study that was actually supposed to start several months ago, but because of COVID, there's been some uh, issues with recruiting patients in the IRB and such, but um, it's going to be a study done by Inigo San Milan at the University of Colorado, um, and it's going to actually take a look at non-diabetic people uh, on and off metformin, so each patient serves as their own control, so it's called it's what we call a crossover, on and off metformin, um, and looking at mitochondrial performance using muscle biopsies, so it's maximum zone two efficiency uh, in that setting. And, and to me, that's going to be the question that matters. So in other words, it's really going to be less about what the lactate is telling us and more about what is the true mitochondrial function at a level that only a biopsy can tell us. I've noticed that my energy levels are extremely low with GLPs. Okay, well, that's not really what we're talking about today, but yes, if you're new to a GLP, and I assume what you mean is a GLP-1 uh, uh, agonist, uh, this is that new class of drug. Well, they're not that new, but uh, many people have probably seen the study that got a ton of news last week um, uh, on a drug called Ozempic. These are drugs that uh, do amazing things for insulin sensitivity and, uh, and, and, and weight loss. Uh, not surprising that you're struggling with that. Um, a lot of it probably has to do with the rapidity with which you're losing weight. So um, in our experience, patients for about eight weeks on those medications will feel pretty crappy uh, or can feel pretty crappy, uh, but then they tend to equilibrate. Um, biopsy is our great future. I couldn't agree more. Uh, duh, duh. Let's see. Will this be saved to a page to view later? Yes, I believe it will. I'm going to save this and I think we're going to post it somewhere. Um, does zone two increase HRV? Okay, good question. Um, again, I haven't seen data to this effect. What I can tell you anecdotally from our patients is um, not that it increases HRV per se, uh, but that it increases deep sleep. So a number of our patients who use uh, tracking devices like the Aura Ring say, um, my zone two training has really added uh, tons of time to my, to my deep sleep. You know, it's gone from being an hour a night or 45 minutes a night to 90 minutes a night. Um, so I've had enough patients say that, that I, I wonder if something is there. It's, it's certainly interesting. Um, personally, I have not observed that. So I have not observed a change in my sleep with and without zone two uh, or a change in uh, heart rate or heart rate variability. Oh, someone says they have a published paper um, that shows zone two increases HRV. So maybe on the other Instagram post for this, you can put a link to that. Um, oh boy, these questions, why are they going so fast? 
Could you do a session on HRV? Yes, probably gonna be doing an entire AMA on HRV. In fact, the only reason I haven't done it yet is we have so many questions that I can't get through it in one uh, AMA session. Um, our notes on HRV are about 50 pages long, and I'm just trying to think how the hell can we condense this into something digestible. Um, what is the role of zone one? Well, interesting. Um, I mean, zone one is what we would call active recovery. So let's, let's, let's be honest. Um, you know, as, as easy as zone two is, it still requires some exertion. Um, and if you're really, truly spent, it's by no means a complete day off. Zone one is, right? So conversely, zone one is, you know, basically going for a walk. Um, you know, to turn walking into zone two, it needs to be very brisk or up a hill. Um, so I think it really comes down to people who are doing a high enough volume of training that they need some time at an even lower time zone. Um, for me, for most of my patients, that's really no longer an option or necessarily a requirement because the, the amount of time I have to train is so low that um, I just don't, you know, I mean, if I can train 12 to 14 hours a week, I want it to be very specific. And if I'm gonna take time off, it's gonna be playing with my kids, which maybe that's zone one, but I'm certainly not gonna sit on a treadmill or a bike and go, you know, at 150 watts. Like I'm not gonna do that now because I just have a better use of my time. Whereas I did that kind of stuff when I was spending 28 hours a week on a bike, which I was at one point in my life. Um, how do you find max heart rate with just a treadmill? So what I recommend is, you know, it's obviously something you need to be very uh, careful with, um, but you, I recommend doing, uh, basically running a, a Bruce protocol. Um, so the, the Bruce protocol, which is named after a famous doctor, Dr. Bruce, uh, is the way we do cardiac stress tests on patients. And actually it's a 21 minute protocol that is pretty much geared to take you to the max and virtually nobody can make it to minute 21. Um, it's also not something you could do on a regular treadmill because the incline at the end is far steeper than most treadmill goes. But what I re basically would recommend doing is um, a three minute ramped effort. Um, and it's a combination of speed and grade, but a greater emphasis on grade than speed, which is what makes it a little bit safer. Um, so I think even in the Bruce protocol, you never, I don't think you really ever get faster than maybe seven miles an hour, but you're at 22% grade by that point. This brings me to another point that I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, and I bet it was asked in here and I missed it. Zone two tends to be activity specific. So a lot of the questions our patients ask are, hey, Peter, is it cool if I go back and forth between doing my zone two on a bike one day, on a treadmill one day, on a rowing machine one day? And look, the answer is, of course it is, but you won't make progress as quickly um, because you're going to, your body gets better at one thing. So I am way better at zone two on a bike than I am a rowing machine. So if I take my zone two wattage, if, 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 let's just so say I'm about 215 to 220 watts on a bicycle. So meaning I'll sit on a bike at that wattage all day and my lactate's just below two. When I go to my rowing machine and do the same wattage, because in a rowing machine, you can control your pace perfectly and I think that would be about a 155 split for 500 meters or something to that effect. But, but there's a converter that will tell you exactly how many watts you need to be, which I've done. After just 20 minutes of that, my lactate's like four and a half. And um, I think that's just frankly because I'm not a rower um, and I'm not efficient at that. Um, and I bet that if all I did was row, and got my lactate totally tuned there, and then I went and did something different, uh, it would be the opposite. And I have patients for whom on a treadmill, they can do X, and then you put them on a bike at a similar met, and their lactate is much higher. So I would just say be mindful of that as you think about how to go about doing this. 
Progress on the book, ETA. No idea. Hope, hoping for early 2022, though. Um, do, do, do. Swimming for zone two. That's an awesome question. Yeah, I would bet it could be done. I really would. I think swimming is one of those sports where, um, you know, certainly in a pool, you have absolutely enough control over your pace um, that I think it would be an amazing way to get zone two in. Um, again, it's a little bit harder to, to sort of measure lactate in a pool. Um, but again, if you started from the standpoint of, okay, um, like I, I know what my maximum heart rate is, I know what my 80% of that is, and especially if you're willing to just swim, I don't know, I'm gonna jump in the water and swim 4,000 yards without stopping and know what my split is. So I'll give you an example. I've never thought of this before, but when I was doing ultra distance swimming, um, uh, like uh, marathon swimming, uh, most of my swimming was done in the open water, of course, but there was one swim in particular, I uh, won't get into the reasons why, I had to do all of my training in the pool. And, um, and it was a 25 yard pool on top of that, so I didn't even have a long course pool. So I was doing like, every weekend I had to do at least one swim longer than 16,000 yards um, of uninterrupted swimming. And it, at some point it was as high as 27, 28,000 yards of uninterrupted swimming, which as you can imagine is like unbearably painful. And the only way I could keep track of how far I was swimming, because I just can't count that high, was I wore a watch and I would check my split every 500 yards. And that meant I had to swim exactly the same pace every 500 yards. And so, yeah, it couldn't be done. I, I would basically hold the exact same split for 500 yards and every 500 yards, all I had to count was 500s. So it was, you know, one 500, two 500s, and then you sort of knew how many 500s you had to swim, and that was a lot easier than managing the yards. Um, so, yep, I would say swimming would be awesome now that I think about it. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. If zone two on a rower is three watts per kilo, good. Look, I think three watts per kilo of zone two is very good, regardless of what avenue you get it on. Um, so meaning if you can do 45 minutes at three watts per kilo of body weight, you're only one watt per kilo below what a professional cyclist is doing. And again, we would hold them up as the absolute benchmark of the, like, I don't think anybody has a better mitochondria than a professional cyclist, right? Um, again, we might be splitting hairs here. You could argue the, the world's greatest marathon runner has an equally good, you know, uh, Kipchoge's mitochondria are just as good and by whatever metric he would be just as efficient. Um, why not go at three millimole? Good question. Um, I think what you'll find is at three millimole, there's no sustaining that indefinitely. What happens at three millimole is it starts to creep up. And the reason is it's empirical, but um, at three millimole, your body's ability to clear that as quickly as you're making it doesn't become sustainable. Um, now, there are probably exceptions to that rule. So there are going to be people who have more um, uh, transporters that can get lactate out of the cell quicker or their liver is going to be more efficient at uh, converting lactate to glucose. Uh, but, but what we find in general is once you go above two, and continue at that same tempo, it stops being sustainable and the lactate will rise. Now, by the way, this is the other thing I should have mentioned earlier. Um, this is not the same as lactate threshold. And lactate threshold is not the same as functional threshold, right? So there's all these different, this nomenclature is so complicated. So um, your lactate threshold um, is, is something that's actually calculated off what's called the lactate performance curve, uh, where you generate lactate so you on the x-axis and the y-axis you have lactate on the x-axis you have um, exertion so on a bike you would do it as watts running or swimming you would have it by pace and you plot the lactate level as these things move and um, the simplest way to do it is just a mathematical tangent trick where you when you see the curve there are basically the curve can be approximated by two tangents where they intersect it tends to be the um, lactate inflection point and that tends to be the threshold and what that basically tells you is once you hit that point you're taking off really quickly so knowing that is that's about the place 
where you would, you know, that's, so, so if you're running a marathon, for example, you can, you can run that last half mile at about that pace, but not much more. Once you get above lactate threshold, you need to rein it back in pretty quickly. And so, and that's, by the way, that's true no matter who you are. Right? So even the greatest cyclist in the world, when they're pushing up Alpe d'Huez, and they are at moments exceeding lactate threshold, they have to rein it back in. Um, you know, they might be able to sustain that for 20 or 30 minutes, uh, but they're, they're going to have to pull that back on the descent if there's another climb to be had. Um, when do I check my lactate post-workout? Immediately, right? So this is not one of those things where I uh, finish the workout, you know, do my stretching and then check it. No, no, it's lactate clears quickly when you're not exercising. So uh, I've got, you know, about a 60 second window to, to get that thing checked. And, and so I'm, I'm pretty anal about it, as you can imagine. I've got my, I've already taken the strip out. I have the little poker. I have all my stuff sitting right there to do the check the second I'm done. Um, have I used my CGM to titrate my zone two, looking for optimal power, pace, heart rate for glucose disposal? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to, and I, I, I don't, I haven't been able to kind of figure out what the what the formula is. But I know the following: when I'm doing zone two, my glucose disposal follows great, and if I'm fasted, it's even better. Um, but I, but I don't think I have a better sense of it than that. Um, uh, is there a benefit of hot and cold water therapy at bolstering cold too? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, but I have done some sauna testing to see if extreme heat can get my lactate up to two. Um, and I have not got hot enough to get there yet, but I'm still trying. So I, I do have a hypothesis that um, when you look at some of the benefits of sauna, and we covered this, I think, in one of the AMAs, I think the benefits of sauna are legion. Um, and... Uh, it certainly begs the question, what mediates that benefit? Uh, well, well, certainly one of the things that would be sort of, you know, sort of the cardiovascular component of, of, of you know, extreme heat. And so I, I was curious if being at, you know, super high heat in a sauna was generating um, enough lactate. And I have not found it yet. So it uh, doesn't mean that's not the case, but, but I haven't seen that. Uh, and someone I can see is just asking that, actually. Do, do, do. Is fasted cardio superior for fat loss? Um, yeah, again, that's a complicated question. Um, I, I would say it depends. I, I think that's a bit too complicated. Uh, does zone two help the CNS? Uh, it depends what you mean by the CNS. Um, but probably not in the way you're asking it. If you're asking it, does it help your brain? Yes. But it's not, I don't think of this as a form of neuromuscular training um, the way we see the higher intensity stuff or some of the strength training. So do I think therefore that some uh, L1, sorry, I don't know what that question means. You can super starch prior to zone two or fasted. Yeah, I usually do it fasted. I do my zone twos in the morning and I do it before I eat, um, but I, I, I would, fully endorse taking a you can before if you felt you needed to. Is zone two different than math? Yes, uh, discussed earlier and this video will be available for folks who understand that. Where did I purchase this meter? I found it online. Again, it's Novo Biomedical Lactate Plus. It's a rip off, I'm warning you. Um, latest thoughts on rapamycin, loving every second of it. How often do I recommend doing zone twos? At least three times a week. I like four. Does it feel unbelievably slow in zone two? No, not unbelievably slow. Uh, as I said, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's just, on the er uh, just on the verge. Um, what is the actual definition of zone two? Okay, already covered. Uh, won't your lactate be at the highest at the end of the ride? Um, not really. It, 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 again, it depends. I mean, that's what we're looking for, to be, to be honest, right? So what we're looking for is being 
in that zone long enough that you reach a new steady state. So, um, for example, if you're zone two, if you believe it to be 175 watts and you spend 45 minutes at 175 watts and you check it every 10 minutes, um, if it's a if it's two millibol at the end, you're right. It was below two millibol. You know, probably 15 minutes in, you were only at 1.5. In fact, I've long stopped doing that, but initially I was doing that. I was doing checks every 15 minutes, and what you realized is you sort of get this curve that looks like this. But again, you know, if you're in zone two, um, usually about 30 to 45 minutes in, it kind of stays put. Um, and it's that plateau is what you're looking for. Um, any evidence that zone two promotes angiogenesis of coronary collaterals? Not that I'm aware of. Um, what does your threshold training protocol look like over under sweet spot? Um, well, again, I don't do over under sweet spot anymore because I don't ride a bike any. I mean, I don't, you know, do anything serious for cycling. When I do zone five now, this is my workout and it's super easy peasy. It's three minutes at zone two, one minute at um, effectively uh, close to a VO2 max effort. Um, and the way I titrate it is it's so hard that I need the three minutes in zone two to be ready to do it again, if that makes sense. So again, um, from a heart rate perspective, when I finish it, when I finish that one minute, I am at, I'm within two beats of my maximum heart rate. Um, but obviously just at the end, because I, to be able to sustain an effort for one minute, remember, it's a lot easier than like a 10 second all out. Um, so it's my hardest effort I can sustain for 60 seconds, such that three minutes later, I'm ready to do it again. So that's a four minute cycle that I just do over, 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 over for, you know, five, six, seven rounds. And by the way, I'm only doing that once a week. Um, do I always bike for zone two? These days, yes, I bike exclusively for zone two. Back when I traveled a lot, if I was at a hotel or at a place where the bike sucked, I would treadmill and I had a whole, I knew exactly what I needed to do on a treadmill. It was um, whatever the steepest incline is on treadmills. I think it's about 15 degrees and it was, I forget how many miles per hour, but it was, you know, less than four miles per hour. Um, so it was a very brisk walk at 15 degrees. So, uh, and, and that was totally adequate. Um, bike outside or on trainer. Well, obviously uh, more enjoyable outside, but in, on the trainer is really the easiest way to do this. Um, all right, I'm gonna, we're gonna go three more minutes here. How does body comp fit into watts per kilo? Well, I think of body comp as a different set of goals. So I think it's important to have lots of different metrics. And so I think that when it comes to body comp, I think what we wanna really focus on is what fraction of the body is lean mass and what are we doing to maintain lean mass as we age? So that's something where we look at DEXA scans and we think a lot about, you know, hey, you know, can you go from, you know, being 45 to 55 and preserve lean mass. That's an important goal um, with respect to body comp. And then of course, you know, how many watts per kilo can you do and, and what, where, how much can you prevent that decline uh, so that you know, by the time you get to the finish line, can you be above a certain level? Um, VO2 max is also something I have a point of view on, right? How, how, how high a VO2 max do I want to have at the very end of the line and how do I work backwards to where it needs to be today? Um, how does glucose disposal increase longevity? It is one of the most important parts of longevity and when you look at the relationship between glucose disposal and longevity, this is one of the most common things that deteriorates with people as they age, not even in a disease state, meaning you don't have to have type two diabetes, um, which is obviously a failure of glucose disposal. Uh, but I'm saying even a person with, without diabetes is going to see a slow drift towards reduced um, glucose disposal. Um, all right, we've got another minute here. Do, do, do. Does zone two increase NO production? Um, 
You know, that's a very good question. I, I should probably know the answer to that, and I don't. Um, so hopefully someone does know the answer to that. Uh, is Kevin Sayer trying to create? Yes, I think Dexcom is very interested in um, many people having access to uh, CGM. It is obviously an important tool for not just diabetics, but um, obviously everybody. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you very much. That was fun. That hour floated by pretty quick. And um, I'm going to save this video. We'll repost it uh, probably as an IG story or on IGTV. So anyone who missed the beginning can hopefully uh, check it out when it's all said and done.